Build your business and improve your finances from the inside out with Joan Sotkin on The Prosperity Show. Hi, everyone. Joan Sotkin here. And for over 30 years, I've been helping people reach their business, financial, and personal goals. And via this podcast, I'd like to do that for you, too. My approach is holistic, which means we look at many internal aspects of you, including your physical, emotional, and spiritual health, as well as the business and financial skills you need to acquire in order to succeed in a complex world. My main site is prosperityplace.com, where you'll find lots of information to help you reach your goals. I hope you'll visit the site and download the free information that's available. And while you're there, I'd love to have you check out the Intention Plus Action Coaching Group, which meets twice a month. And it's a place where you can share what's going on. It's an accountability group where you say what you want to accomplish and what you have accomplished. And you get coaching along the way because the group setting is perfect for hearing what other people are going through or have accomplished. And it's inspiring and helpful in terms of figuring out what you need to do now and in the future. So I hope you'll go to prosperityplace.com slash intentions and check it out. If you want to talk to me about it, there's a link to set up a call to talk to me, or you can just sign up. It's very affordable and it's ongoing and you can come as often as you like. And it also includes a number of bonuses, which you'll see when you go to the site. So now let's get to the interview. As many of you know who have been listening to this show, I am a bit of a science nerd and love brain science because the brain is what's running our life. And the more you understand about it, the, the better your decisions will be uh, in business and finances and in life in general. And I recently read the book, The Molecule of More, which I've mentioned before, and it absolutely changed my thinking about the brain chemical dopamine. It is so much more complicated than anything you're going to see in the popular literature and on YouTube and, and all this stuff about how do I get more dopamine and uh, the dopamine fast. I mean, so much of it is just, from my point of view, missing the mark. So I am so pleased that today we get to interview the author of The Molecule of More, Daniel Z. Lieberman, and uh, he, to me, has presented dopamine in such an understandable and complete way. So let me introduce him, and then we'll get into the interview. Dr. Daniel Z. Lieberman is a professor and vice chairman for clinical affairs in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at George Washington University. Dr. Lieberman is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a recipient of the Karen Foundation Research Award. In addition to writing science books, he works with patients, teaches medical students, and does behavioral research. Dr. Lieberman, welcome to the Prosperity Show. Thank you, Joan. It's great to be here. This is kind of a different venue for you because we're, we're talking about prosperity, and yet to me, understanding dopamine is, is going to help people understand better what, kind of, what they can do to make better decisions about their money and their business. So would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's so true. I, I mean, we are long past the age when um, wealth was generated through muscle power and physical power. And um, in our economy, the brain is the most important variable going on. Um, that's where um, all of our new wealth comes from, from good ideas. So I think that if people are interested in prosperity, uh, they've got to understand the brain. Absolutely. So give us a, an overview. I mean, you, know, you wrote a whole book about it. Uh, give us just an overview of what we should know about the basics of dopamine. 
Well, you know, dopamine is a chemical that the brain uses to process information. And these are called neurotransmitters. If you look at the scientific literature, there's been more research done on dopamine than any of the other neurotransmitters. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that dopamine exerts a profound influence over our lives. It affects the decisions we make. It affects the experiences we have. It affects how hard we work, how much we enjoy the fruits of our labors. People tend to think of dopamine in an overly simplified way. They think of it in terms of the pleasure molecule. And the reason that um, I and my co-author, Mike Long, wrote this book is because there is so much more to it, and it is an absolutely fascinating topic. And when people think about dopamine, as you said, it's, they think of the pleasure principle. What else does it affect, particularly for business people, the, the creativity, the, the ambition, all of these things? Yeah, well, you know, dopamine is the brain molecule of the future. Its job is to maximize future resources. It's constantly pushing us to make things better. And so, yes, it is the pleasure molecule, but it gives us pleasure of a specific kind and under certain circumstances. It gives us pleasure when we're anticipating something that's going to make our life better. It's an excitement pleasure. It's an enthusiasm pleasure. It is not a contentment pleasure saying, ah, everything is just fine because that's not compatible with what a future molecule does. If you feel the pleasure of contentment, of satisfaction, it doesn't make you want more. It makes you feel like you have enough, but dopamine always wants you make more. So, for example, I, I don't know if you've ever re read the uh, children's book, Winnie the Pooh, but um, Christopher Robin asks him, what's your favorite thing in the world? And not surprisingly, Winnie the Pooh is about to say eating honey, when suddenly he stops because he realizes there's a moment right before you start to eat that's even more pleasurable, but he didn't know what that moment was called. Well. Now you know what that moment was called. It's called dopamine. It's the pleasure of anticipation of your future about to get much, much better. And, and that's why it's not only the neurotransmitter of pleasure, it's also the neurotransmitter of creativity, making things that never existed before for a better future. It's the neurotransmitter of motivation, working hard to overcome obstacles to get a better future. Dopamine is all about improving the future. And are some people, do some people have more dopamine than others? Yes, they do. They do. Um, there are um, genetic tests we can do to evaluate how active a person's dopamine system is going to be. Uh, they're simplistic. There are other things besides these genes that influence it. But when we look at large numbers of people, we can see broad trends. And people who have highly active dopamine systems are more likely to be entrepreneurs, as I'm sure many of your listeners are. They're also more likely to be artists and people involved in creative fields. And they're also more likely to suffer from mental illness. The highly dopaminergic brain might be thought of as being similar to a high performance sports car. It's capable of doing amazing things, but it can break down easily. So people who are always looking for more dopamine in, you know, they're saying, what vitamins do I have to take? And what can I do? The people going on these dopamine fasts where they're trying not to stimulate dopamine for X number of days is as if more dopamine is always better. But I can personally attest to the fact that my impulsive decisions and my getting bored easily, and there are a lot of things that I recognize are part of who I am, are because I have overactive dopamine and I've had to learn how to manage my expectations 
and and limit what I get excited about. Yeah, dopamine may lead to pleasure, but it does not lead to happiness. <laughs> I um, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In some ways, um, happiness is anathema to what dopamine is trying to accomplish. Because if you're happy, that means you're content with the way things are right now. And that's kind of a sign to stop. Uh, stop working, stop striving, stop pushing for change, and just enjoy. And that's not dopamine. Uh, that is brought about by a different set of neurotransmitters that balance out dopamine. You know, like a car that has an accelerator and a brake, the brain consists of circuits that are in opposition to one another in order to get the fine control you get driving a car with an accelerator and a brake and in order to achieve balance. So there are circuits in the brain, there are other chemicals, neurotransmitters that balance and oppose dopamine. And instead of being focused on constantly making the future better, these neurotransmitters allow us to be in the present moment, to enjoy all of the things that our dopamine circuits worked so hard to get. And, and, and your listeners are probably familiar with some of these. Uh, they include endorphin, serotonin, endocannabinoid, and oxytocin. Um, these are things that are associated with satisfaction, contentment, enjoying the pleasures of being with other people, enjoying the pleasures of sensory stimulation. I love the way you call those the here and now chemicals rather than the future oriented ones. And, and so that helped me understand that when I'm looking to the future, I'm, I'm not in the here and now, I'm in the dopamine. And uh, I, I really like the here and now chemicals as well, the serotonin and the oxytocin. And I'm a, I've been meditating since 1972, so I'm very into learning how to get into the moment. And I think that that's something that helps to balance this impulsiveness that, I, that I've always had, or the getting super excited about what's going to happen. You know? <laughs> and now I know there's nothing wrong with me. I just have that particular gene and, and brain chemical. And so what I'd like to look at is, you know, this whole idea of the reward prediction error and how that can lead to disappointment and what we can do to mollify that. Sure. So um, let's start looking at um, perhaps uh, the, the positive aspect of reward prediction error. So um, dopamine does not release every time you do something that gives you a better future. It only releases when your future turns out to be unexpectedly better than the present. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, let's say that um, my boss were to call me into his office later this afternoon and say, Dan, I got some great news for you you're getting a raise. Well, that was totally unexpected. Uh, and so my brain made a reward prediction error. My brain was predicting that my salary was gonna be the same today as it was yesterday. It made an error. The future is better than I thought. I get dopamine. Now, let's look ahead four or five months from now, I've been getting my new larger salary for four or five months. Every month my paycheck comes. I expect it. There's no more error. And even though my salary is the same four months from now as it is today, it's no longer giving me dopaminergic pleasure because dopamine only comes when something unexpected happens. And, and we can turn this into a very simple mathematical formula. Dopamine release equals the actual reward minus the expected reward. When I find out about that raise, the expected reward is zero. And so I get this big dopamine hit associated with this wonderful actual reward. Two, three, four months from now, the expected reward is exactly the same as the actual award. And so dopamine goes down to zero. 
And what if you get less than you expected? Like I'm putting this project together, I'm going to publish my book and I'm going to have lots of people buying the book and I get it up there and the sales are miserable. So now we've gone into the negative territory, all right? The expected reward is success, book sales. The actual reward is perhaps zero. And so now we've gone into negative. And that also affects dopamine firing. When, when we're at rest, our dopamine uh, system fires at around five times per second. When something good happens, it zooms up to 20 or 30 times per second. When we get that disappointment, when we're expecting something good and it fails to materialize, dopamine can go all the way down to zero, and that feels terrible. Subjectively, uh, what we feel inside is resentment and deprivation. And disappointment. Disappointment. Yeah, think about what happens if you, uh, you're standing in line to get your morning coffee and muffin. And all of a sudden your cell phone rings. You've got to come into work right away. It's an emergency. No coffee and muffin for you this morning. That's going to be resentment, deprivation, and disappointment. And that's because your dopamine system has just shut down. Okay. So now comes the part that really interests me. It's amazing to me how many people have what I call a disappointment habit where they don't get what they want more often than they get what they want. And it seems to me that that habit starts early in childhood when someone's needs are not met so that there's an expectation of not getting the reward. Am I looking at that correctly? It's complicated because if you have an expectation of not getting the reward and then you do get it, that's a positive reward prediction error. And so that can actually feel good. And as a result, some people will go in trying to lower their expectations so that no matter what happens, they get an upside surprise and that leads to dopamine. Well, it seems to me that by managing your expectations, that you get more rewards. In other words, if I, if I, you know, I love the philosophy of don't be attached to the outcome. You know, if I, if I teach myself, and, and I think I've done that, to just kind of accept what is and not be attached to the outcome, then I have the potential of getting those good boosts. Am I looking at it correctly? Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. I think that the people who get in trouble are the people who are always expecting the best. Uh, um, so, for example, if you go to uh, a luxury resort, um, you will see people who are just devastated because their bed is not folded down with a mint on the pillow. <laughs> or they go to some expensive restaurant and, and they bring this magnificent dish, but I don't know that the garnish is put in the wrong place and people get upset about that. So if you're not careful, you can always be focusing on what is lacking, even in the presence of all of this wonderful luxury. So you're right. You've got to manage your expectations. Um, you've got to go into a situation expecting the worst so that when good things happen, it's a surprise. And that's interesting because in all the mindset teaching that people are doing, they're being taught to always have a positive expectation. And as a result, there are a lot of people who are walking around unhappy because they've expected too much. Yeah, yeah. I think that maybe we need to be a little bit more detailed here. And, and perhaps you might have a positive expectation for your own performance because that will lead to confidence and better performance and low expectations for other people's performance because that will lead to dopamine surprises. So for example, if I'm gonna go up and, and, and teach a class, I should go in there expecting that I'm gonna teach a great class and people are going to love it. And I should also be expecting that the, um, the technology is gonna fail, everything's gonna be a mess. 
uh, the students aren't going to be prepared, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll go in with a high degree of confidence for my own performance and a very low level of expectation for what I'm going to be dealing with. Well, that's interesting because like in the podcast world, some people get really obsessed about their stats, how many downloads they get. Yeah, and yeah. I, I decided that that wasn't a good idea. I just should enjoy doing the podcast. And, and once in a while, I'll look at the stats just as a comparison. Is it going up? Is it going down? But to not, not give a value of good or bad to whatever that number is. And because my goal is to be able to live in a peace of mind state of being where nothing much upsets me, uh, because to me, that's healthier and just a better way to live. And by not <clears throat> obsessing on the statistics, things that depend on other people's behavior, um, only focusing on what I'm doing makes it easier to detach from those results. Uh, yeah, I find it so interesting the way that people react simply to numbers. Um, you know, video game designers know this, and so they always put the score front and center. And people will play a video game and, and work through these hard electronic tasks for no other reason than to make the number go up. And it's the same with likes on social media. It's the same with views on podcasts or listens. Uh, we can get obsessed with this uh, raw number just going up. And every time it goes up, we get a little bit of a dopamine hit. Every time it fails to go up, we get a dopamine drop. And we experience that feeling of deprivation and resentment. The problem is that ultimately that number is never going to be satisfying. No matter how high it goes, we're always going to want more because it doesn't trigger oxytocin or endorphin or endocannabinoid. It only triggers dopamine and dopamine can never experience satisfaction. That's simply not what the chemical does. It can only make us want more, more, more. So, you know, sometimes I also find myself obsessively checking sales numbers and sales ranks and all of those things. And it just makes me more dissatisfied. On the other hand, when another human being said to me, hey, I read your book. It, it was so moving and, and, and it changed my life in this way. That's true satisfaction. Uh, and that will stick with me for a very long time. It's interesting because uh, along with disappointment habits, it's amazing to me, people will say to me, I've never been satisfied. And, and I have to teach them how to recognize the feeling of satisfaction so they can give that message to the brain that this is what I'd rather be feeling. And uh, what I'm hearing from you and, and reading your book is that in order to be satisfied, you have to decide to train yourself to be satisfied and to get beyond that more. You know, I, I meet a lot of people who think that a little bit more money is going to make them happy. And I call it over-earning. The people who uh, have X number of millions and they think that one more million is going to be what they need. And I say, when you get that one more, you're just going to want another one. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. And People and have to decide what they want out of life. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a number of patients who uh, are lawyers and they work for very large law firms and uh, they make large amounts of money and they're miserable because they work 60, 70 hour weeks they, they work during the day, they work during the night, they work on the weekends. There's so much pressure to constantly produce billable hours. And I, I say, look, with all of this money, you're miserable. Why are you trying to make so much money? Um, don't you want to do things in life that make you happy? Um, and there, there's one guy I'm working with who after 10 or 15 years, He's finally stepping back from this rat race. But typically people just simply can't do it. 
um, and they cannot they cannot trade dopaminergic joy of accomplishment for the more endorphin joy of simply being content. So they're actually addicted to the more. I think that's right. I think they are. Yeah. Because that's what happens with addictions is that you get used to what you've got and you want more and, and you can't stop that. So are people approaching addiction cure, for lack of a better word, by, by just wanting will, using willpower? Isn't there more to it than, than understanding, you know, well, you've just got to stop? Yeah, there's so much more to it. Um, before we go on to addiction, though, I, I, I wanted I want to raise one more point with regard to the idea of people who are dopamine driven, uh, for people who are constantly dissatisfied, constantly trying to make another million dollars, um, and that is that these people these people will be dissatisfied. They they will never find happiness, and that's very sad for them. But at the same time, these people are really good for the rest of us. Um, they sort of sacrifice their happiness in order to move the world forward. Um, if you look at the, um, the pioneers of our society, pioneers in history, um, Steve Jobs, um, Isaac Newton, um, Elon Musk, you, you know, all of these people who are pushing the world forward, they're all unhappy people. Because if they weren't dissatisfied, they would not be working in this passionate way of never stopping. Uh, it takes unhappiness and dissatisfaction to act as a goad to make people do great things. And, and, and so I advise my patients to be happy, but I feel in the full disclosure um, of honesty, we have to say, look, yeah, let's go for happiness, but what we're going to be sacrificing is greatness. And, and people need to realize that there is a trade-off there. Um, John Cleese, uh, the brilliant comedian from Monty Python, um, he, he um, I, I think the comedy he did changed the field of comedy. Um, and and it's, it, it's a landmark thing, but he was always angry and he was always miserable. And finally he got himself into psychotherapy and he overcame his anger and his misery and after that, he no longer produced genius comedy. And he's aware of it. And he said, in retrospect, if he had been given the choice, do you want to continue to be great or do you want to be happy? He would have chosen happiness. But, but we've got to be honest that there is that trade-off. You cannot be both great and happy at the same time. Wow, that's a major statement. Because there's so much literature out there about you know, good to great. You know the the book Good to Great. Everyone, you know, how do how do we get great? And I, to me, Jeff Bezos is the perfect example of someone who's overdoing it. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like he has it's like he's lost his empathy, and all that matters to him is more. And and in the in the long run, he's made life quicker for people but not necessarily better for the planet. And, and to me, I would rather be conscious and happy than great because of what you do have to say. You know, the, our, our concept of great might, might need a little adjusting. You know, to say that the, the person with the most money wins and the person with the most money is great that's kind of a weird way of measuring something. It is. I think it is. But at the same time, I, I think it's, um, it's not completely invalid because it's not just the pursuit of money that makes people unhappy. It's the pursuit of all forms of greatness. Um, we might look at Albert Einstein, um, perhaps the greatest physicist of modern times, uh, certainly the greatest physicist of modern times. He revolutionized the way we understand the world, the universe. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for physics. One might say, if anybody has the right to feel happy and satisfied, he does. But he died miserable. And, and the reason is, 
is that after developing relativity, um, he kind of dried up and he wasn't able to take the next step in terms of moving things forward. He, he, he was not able to constantly accomplish more. Uh, and as a result, he was a very unhappy man when he died. Not so different from someone who pursued money all their life and then discovered that money was hollow. Um, so we need these great people. Um, they deserve to know that what they're doing is going to make them unhappy. But I, I think that many of them won't care. Um, you know, we, we've got these miserable artists. And if we told them, look, you can choose to give up your art or, and be happy, or you can just be miserable and pursue your vision, you know what they're going to choose. All right. So are you saying that if you're going to be a successful artist, it's pretty hard to be happy? I think so. At least it's hard to be happy for extended periods of time. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I saw this um, show on Netflix about creativity. I think it was called The Art of Design. And um, one of the uh, people that were being featured, I believe he was an illustrator for the New Yorker magazine, spoke about how sometimes when he's doing his best work, he is miserable. And he did not know why it was. And it's hard, it's hard to explain. You would think that that would be deeply satisfying. But the artistic process is a difficult one to understand. Um, and these people are being driven by something that is probably not happiness. I would say it's probably meaning. Okay. And so for entrepreneurs who tend to be often dissatisfied and unhappy, is it because they're pursuing money or pursuing recognition that and and they're not pursuing happiness? That, that's exactly right. Uh, you can pursue money and recognition, but one thing you have to understand is that it will never be enough, right? I, I mean, you, you, you look at billionaires, there's no way they can spend all of that money. But what they do is they say, well, the other guy has got two billion. And it bothers me that he's got more than I do. Um, I, I've got a few patients who are entrepreneurs and they rarely talk about money. Um, they usually just talk about the need to keep starting new businesses. They start a business, they sell it. They start a business, they sell it. And, um, you know, the money is there to keep score, but that's about it. Okay, so... Because I decided that I wanted to be satisfied, that I wanted to learn to be satisfied. And it took a lot for me to, to learn that, to teach my brain. And I often work with my clients who are never satisfied, <laughs> they're entrepreneurs, to teach them how to recognize the feeling of satisfaction. And that when they're feeling dissatisfied, to know that they have that choice to to become to think of a satisfying thing and kind of change the brain pattern at that point. So I wonder if you're saying that if you teach yourself to be satisfied, that you're not going to be as good at what you're doing. I think that's very true. You know, throughout history, if we look at um, cultural traditions, there's always a sense that people need to make sacrifices. Um, you can't go through life without intentionally putting some things to the side. And um, sacrifices are hard. And if you want to be happy, there are sacrifices you're going to need to make. Maybe you're not going to be regional manager. Maybe you're not going to be able to live in a giant house that you dreamed about as a child. Um, I, I think that in our society, we, we kind of have this idea that you can have it all. And that's absolutely not true. Um, if you want to have it all, there is one thing that you will definitely not have, and that is happiness. <laughs> that, that's so interesting. And since many of the people who are listening to this are entrepreneurs, what we're talking about is you have to make a choice as to where yeah. you want to be. And we do have the choice as to how we want to feel and what path we want to take in life once we understand how we're being driven by our genetics and our brain chemistry. That's right. And one of the essential things towards living a good, fulfilling life is flexibility. 
It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, maybe we can train ourselves to sometimes pursue happiness. Uh, and in other times, maybe we can train ourselves to pursue other forms of satisfaction, like money, like accomplishment. But we don't want to be the workaholic who goes on vacation and is constantly checking her email, nor do we want to be the unmotivated person who goes to work and never makes anything of himself. Right. And most states aren't all the time. I mean, we have the the choice of weekends letting go and being where we want to be on weekends. So, but And so what we're really talking about is choices. Once we understand how our brains work, we can understand that we have more choices. We can. and But I think we also, it's very important to appreciate that it's how hard it is. It's not like choosing vanilla ice cream instead of strawberry ice cream. <laughs> okay. It's more like choosing to run a marathon instead of sitting on the couch watching TV. You're not going to run a marathon tomorrow. If that's what you want to do, it takes an enormous amount of training. And if you want the ability to sometimes choose happiness and sometimes choose accomplishment, it could take years to train your brain to get there. Took me about 20. <laughs> but I was determined to be able to maintain a peace of mind. Uh, one of my goals was to not let my money determine how I feel, and the other was to not worry. And and that, those were my goals. That and and to be able to succeed, but not to let go of that peace of mind. And mm -hmm. it takes a lot of effort because there's so many things coming at you saying, dissatisfied, dissatisfied, dissatisfied. <laughs> you know, so. I mean, one may even argue that this is, this is a lifetime task. Yes, that, I, and uh, I, I agree completely. We never reach the end of growth. Um, we can always become, we can always chase a higher humanity. And um, that's kind of what, what life is about. No matter how satisfied we are, we can't stand still. We have to either go up or down. And and I and people say to me, "When will I be done?" And <laughs> I say, "When you're dead." <laughs> you know? yep, that's right. You've got till the last day. Um, I remember when my father was uh, finishing up. I said to him, "Is there anything you regret that you didn't do?" And he said, "There was so much more to learn." You know, and I realize that that's where I get my dopamine is from learning new things. So I, I learned that from him. And, and, you know, I come from a family of learners. So it's really about choices. And let's go back for a moment. We touched on uh, addiction because that's so important if you're understanding dopamine. And so tell me how you uh, uh, approach the addiction thing from a dopamine point of view rather than a willfulness thing. In other words, to say to a person, well, you just have to give it up because right. that just doesn't work. Right. Well, you know, we've got um, more than one dopamine circuit in the brain. Um, we, we've actually got three main ones. In the book, we, we focus on two of them. Um, the desire circuit that gives us motivation and pleasure and tends to be focused on the short term and the control circuit, which um, allows us to reason and plan and execute complicated plans and tends to focus on the longer term. So we say, um, if you're using willpower, you're basically fighting your desire circuit and you're gonna lose because it's stronger than you are. Uh, what you wanna use is strategy. Um, find ways to avoid situations in which you're going to be experiencing craving. Um, get everything out of your life that reminds you of the drug. Don't go to parties where the substance is being consumed. Um, it's better to be smart than strong because strong only works for a limited amount of time. And when I was giving up my food addiction and my shopping addiction, <laughs> What I had to do was recognize the feeling that I would get in my chest when I needed to have it. I got to have it. 
And I wasn't allowed to buy anything when I was feeling that. And if I felt it like when I was opening the refrigerator one more time, I wasn't allowed to open the refrigerator. So I had to become aware of of my internal signals that were telling me to do something that was going to hurt me. Yeah. The, the experience of craving is a very unpleasant one. And um, so we tend to do one of two things. One is we give into it because we have the feeling that the only way we're going to make it go away is by giving into it. Um, and everybody feels that way when they crave, and it's just not true. Uh, the truth of the matter is that cravings rarely last more than 20 minutes. Uh, and if you can get through that 20 minutes, it's going to be gone. But another thing we do when we experience craving is we, um, we try to push that feeling down because it's so unpleasant. But what you're talking about is the better strategy, and that is let yourself feel it. Um, and what you find is it's actually not that bad. Uh, <laughs> right. you, you You're, know, not, gonna You're <laughs> not gonna die. You're not gonna die. You're not gonna die. You can live with it. Yeah. Uh, and, and and I recommend the patients do the opposite. I immerse themselves in it. Try and experience it as much as they can. And what they find out is that it, it, it's weaker than they thought it was. And it's it's not so bad. And that's true of actually any feeling. If, if you're trying to get rid of a habitual, uncomfortable feeling, like shame or deprivation, when you let yourself feel it completely is when it's going to dissipate. Exactly. You do something that you're embarrassed about, you feel ashamed. If you push it away it's going to go down and, and it's going to influence you over and over again in ways that you will not recognize. It will make you frightened in similar situations. If you embrace the feeling though, and you immerse yourself in it, um, it's going to go away and, and, and it's not going to ambush you at unexpected times. This to me is so fascinating. Um, one more question. I'm finding that the more I learn from people like you and your book and all the stuff I'm reading, that it really helps me understand other people better. That I can see when they're doing dopamine or when they're doing serotonin. And I become a lot more tolerant of their behavior because I see that they're not making conscious choices to be where they are, that they're just be doing it because they're, you know, it's like automatic. Yes, you know, we've heard that from a number of our readers. They say, we read the molecule of more, and um, I not only understand myself better, I understand other people better. And by, you know, if somebody is annoying you, um, typically because they're very different from you, you're H&N, you're here and now, they're dopaminergic, or vice versa. If you can objectify it a little bit, step back and think about what's happening on a chemical level, it becomes much less annoying. And people found that um, the politics chapter in The Molecule of More was particularly helpful because maybe members of their family hold very different political views than they do. They're sitting at the dinner table wanting to explode. But if they can get themselves inside their loved one's brain, see it from their perspective by understanding these brain circuits we talk about, they say it completely changes their relationship with them. It makes it so much easier. They can't help it. <laughs> you know? They can't help it. And, and, and also their way of seeing it is valid. It's valid from their perspective. Both perspectives are valid and both perspectives are necessary. We do not want one uh, unopposed by the other. We want balance. And we're, a lot of stuff in our politics now is out of balance. I mean, it's, it it, is. It, yeah. it's so polarized. But I find that the more I understand about this, the more I can let it go and just let them, I don't get angry at anything. I, I, I've decided not to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, I work through all the anger. You know, I punch things and I, I learned that you don't hit the wall because <laughs> you know, it hurts your yes. hand. <laughs> you know? And uh, once you've worked through all those things, I, I've 
been developing what I call empathetic detachment, mm -hmm. where you can care about what's going on, like the kids in cages and that sort of thing. But you don't have to feel that you have to fix it today. That's such a good way of looking at it. You know, we all have our role in this world. Um, and we all want to make this country a better place. And we don't make it a better place by becoming furious about things we can't control. We make it a better place by doing our role as well as we can and being kind and compassionate to those around us. And, and, and fury and rage, um, that does not make the world a better place. And that's a whole nother chapter on how you go beyond that. I want to, first of all, tell people how they can find you and your book, which is, seems to be everywhere, um, and, and how, where, you, where you hang out. Uh, the book is on Amazon, um, easy to find there. It's also in local bookstores. Um, they can learn more about me at danielzlieberman.com. That's Z is in zebra. And uh, the molecule of more.com uh, also has more information about the book. Oh, okay. I didn't know that about that one. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. You have definitely enriched my life. And thank I, you so much and for I'm having telling me. so many people to go read the book. So I, I, you know, my, my idea of a rock star <laughs> is very different. And you're one of my rock stars. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So thank you for being here with me today. Thanks again. Bye now. Bye-bye. It's a couple of weeks since I read The Molecule of More, and it's really affecting how I'm doing my coaching, how I'm interacting with people, because I've really come to understand so much more, not only about myself, but about other people as well. I highly recommend this book. There's only four or five books that I've really pushed since I've been doing this podcast, and this is one of them. It's easy to read. It's not, you know, real science geeky. It's very easy to understand and will help you understand yourself and other people. So check it out. I have a link to it on the show notes on prosperityplace.com, or you can get it at Amazon. And I look forward to Dr. Lieberman's next book, which he tells me is about the subconscious mind, but it's going to be a while before that one comes out. So that's it for today. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye now. Bye now.